Hey, I'm Greg Gillismith, and I'm out here at the lab in front of our ISO shipping container house. This has been a project that's been ongoing for a little while. I've been a bit slowed down with building permits and inspections, uh, but uh, today I'm going to take you inside and uh, share with you some of the engineering as it relates to framing and how do you do that in a shipping container. First of all, we ought to understand what the structure is. So I'm going to take you around where we've cut this container in half to show you what we're doing. Come on inside. So first of all, uh, one thing that uh, may not be obvious uh, looking at this, uh, one, is it's, uh, it's a mess. Uh, it's a real construction site here uh, because it's also happening at a school. Uh, and what you can see is that we have cut a 40-foot container in half. And uh, later on, this half back here is going to be put on the side of the first half that I just walked by, and this will become an end uh, window right next to the cargo doors. So, uh, right here kind of points out some of the differences of what you have going on. And a lot of people don't show a cross section of a container because they don't cut them in half with an angle grinder. So, I'm going to show you what we've got. Right down here at the bottom is a C channel, basically, and uh, it's about an inch or so on this bottom flange and almost two inches on this upper flange. And uh, then that is welded continuously along the entire length of the container to this uh, corrugated metal. Now, uh, at the top of this is welded about a two and a quarter by two and a quarter steel tube. What this really ends up being, and this is kind of the fundamental truth or, or construction that you have to understand about these containers, is that this is basically an I-beam. It has a, has a strong flange up here in the top. It's just in disguise as a tube. And then it has a tall web that's about 91 inches tall. And then it has its other flange down here, which is the C-channel. So what the I-beam is, is it's a structure that optimizes the strength by maximizing the material that's in the top flange and the bottom flange and keeping those pieces of material as far apart as possible to gain strength for the bending of this entire structure. Now the reason that's important is these things are rated to carry 60,000 pounds of load on top of this plywood floor. So what's going on with, with that load? So let's study the load path. Uh, the load goes into this plywood. I'll come down here and give you a uh, cross-section kind of look. It's about an inch and a quarter, inch and an eighth, eighth uh, thick, and it's really small layers, really strong plywood. It's been treated with all kinds of things to resist rot and everything, so we'll be covering this up so we don't get any fumes or whatever up into the container. But the point is that this is a really strong deck that then is supported by some C channels. And they're hard to see because they're back in there in the shadows, but those C channels are located every 12 inches along the entire length of the container. So what you can see is sets of fasteners here, and there's, so there's one joist, 12 inches over is another one, and that goes all the way down for the length of the container. So the load comes into this plywood, it's distributed into these C channels, and that load then from the C channels is brought over to not just this C down here at the bottom, but really that load is brought across in these C channels into this entire I-beam structure, okay? So that's important to realize on how these things are built. Um, they're not necessarily supported along the entire length when they're stacked up on the ships. They're really stacked on their corners. So the load has to be transferred from the plywood out to this entire structure and brought into the two ends that are 40 feet apart. So obviously this I-beam has been made strong enough to support the load across the entire length. Now that's really important because if you think about this as an I-beam, then what do you know about I-beams? You can cut holes in the web because the web is the part that really is only there for shear to keep the top and the bottom move, from moving relative to each other uh, in the shearing direction. So if you punch a hole like this in a normal structure that's made of parallelograms in wood, frame, uh, wood framing, then that entire structure can shift, right? And that becomes a weakness. Now, if this is really just the web of an I-beam and we punch a hole in the middle, it's almost inconsequential. And we have proven that by doing a finite element model of this I-beam. So we took detailed measurements of the cross section. We also compared those to the specifications uh, that they build these containers to and found that they match really quite well. So um, we did a finite element model where we fixed this edge in space 
And then we applied 10,000 pounds of distributed load along the top of that, pushing down. We had no contribution from this roof uh, in our model or the floor. We just analyzed one wall being pushed down, allowing it to twist and bend and do whatever it was going to do to see what it was going to try to do. And sure enough, we found that it uh, does almost nothing. Uh, just the way it's designed. So now, when we punch this hole in here, we really only need to bring back localized stiffness just to keep the wall from moving. So if you look at this, this is corrugated metal here. Uh, it's only about 70 thousandths thick, so that can have a tendency to be a little wavy. And um, now at the top, it doesn't tend to be wavy because it's only about eight or 10 inches away from this big steel tube up here, so it doesn't go anywhere. But along its length, uh, it can get a little warped. And so what we've done is all you can see here from the inside are these bolts. And uh, those are really going through the container to the outside where there is an inch and a half by inch and a half by eighth inch angle iron that goes from top to bottom, kind of like a king stud. And those are bolted onto uh, this wood uh, jam or casing. And then that subassembly of the wood plus the steel is brought in and put onto the container. Now I did it that way uh, because I wanted the steel and the wood to be straight and parallel to each other before they were introduced into the curvy uh, uh, side of the container. I didn't want the steel to conform to the container and then try to conform that to the wood. So I put the two together first and then assemble that onto, uh, onto the structure. All right, so that's the basics of cutting a hole into uh, the side of a container, and we'll see a little bit more of that here in a minute. Now I'll point out here, uh, we can see two ends at one time. One is the end of this uh, container, is basically going to just be a, um, a 48 by 48 window. And uh, we've put a header in here uh, and with our supports and everything because this ceiling is really not that strong. This ceiling is not load bearing in any way. We are going to have an attic and there are going to be uh, snow loads and things like that uh, that are supported by the container. And again, all of that load has to be moved over to the I-beam and then brought down into uh, footings or, or piles. So this end wall is going to be slightly load bearing, uh, so we needed to have uh, the header structure to bring that load into here. And then you can see this is then bolted. It's not tightened up yet, don't, don't worry. Uh, so this is a double top plate, and then it goes through the metal ceiling and goes into our bottom plate of our attic structure. Right now I just have the Tyvek flipped over, so we can't see that. All right, and so on this other side, you can see um, we have uh, the, uh, the bottom plate for the attic is now visible, and the Tyvek sh um, sheeting coming out here. We've wrapped this around. Now, I actually have another wrap of Tyvek that's going to come down over this and replace this. Uh, we got some damage in here while we were framing, and so I need to replace that. So that is waiting to flip down over and go, uh, go uh, underneath our, our siding. So yes, you will notice that this is vertical concrete siding that is turned horizontal. Uh, we'll be using our traditional um, uh, Z metal in here for waterproofing. Uh, and we just did this for appearance uh, purposes that we wanted to mix the horizontal grain of the concrete siding with the vertical grain of a PBR metal galvanized or galvalume uh, siding that's gonna go on the other sides of the structure when it's finished. So um, let me take you on up to see how a door is framed. This is the door that goes from the container into, um, well, from the first container into the second. So this becomes the bedroom door. And uh, here you can see that inch and a half by inch and a half by eighth inch steel. Uh, it's bolted here with quarter 20 fasteners. Uh, all the way up about every 18 inches and then that's screwed in with a Simpson strong drive uh, number nine uh, fasteners that go into um, this uh, framing. So that is the basic uh, construction here. Now we have a whole other discussion about how we're insulating this. That'll be another video. Uh, but suffice it to say, we are not leaving any of this exposed. Uh, there is gonna be two inches of insulation and siding exterior to this. So this is not trying to be a waterproof joint in any way. Uh, a lot of the people that are making these structures are trying to weld all of these um, window and door 
uh, frames so that they are waterproof because the metal container is exterior. Ours will not be. We will have siding and wrap and all those things exterior to this. So here you can see uh, some of the framing from the inside. Now, one thing you have to deal with when you're working in a container is that sometimes your framing or your, your L-metal is on what I call an any. So this corrugation is pushed into the container, whereas this next corrugation is out. And you have to uh, uh, deal with that a little bit, that sometimes you're on an any and sometimes you're on an outie as this uh, framing goes, and it becomes a little more complicated. On my next version of this, I'm actually going to choose my window sizes a little more carefully so that it works with the timing of these corrugations. Uh, the, these, the period of these corrugations from the start of one any to the next start of an any is 11 inches. And so if I use window sizes that are on 11 inch increments, like a 33, it does make it easier because now the, the um, uh, periodicity is the same. So you can see here I'm on an Audi and then on the other side, I'm on, the, on an any. And so it just makes it a little complicated. Uh, but what you have to do is maintain your offset. So in my case, um, this uh, framing is offset one inch in from the corrugations um, because I have one inch of insulation that's going to go here and so all this will uh, get contained and then on the outside I have two inches of framing between the outer corrugation and the outside of the framing for my two inches of ins insulation. Uh, and you can see that insulation here. It's uh, called GPS, graphite filled polystyrene and there's an example of the one inch and the two inch. So that's it uh, for some of the framing details, um, and we'll be covering uh, different topics with each video, but this is a great time and place in uh, our overview to show how we've put this together. Um, I should probably put another video together just on how we constructed these insulated door um, assemblies. So that's it for now. We'll tune in next time.